When it comes to dating the age of the Earth, there's only one tool for that. It's radiometric dating. When we want to know about the deep ice cores, radiometric dating. Want to know the age of a moon? Radiometric dating. Age of the meteors? Radiometric dating. You get the picture. Until now, these dates have not favored young Earth creation. As a matter of fact, both heat problems from two of the most popular young Earth creation FUD models exist trying to deal with radiometric dates that they give. That said, there are some assumptions that go into radiometric dating. There are eight major ones that actually go into this, and until recently, none of them could be actually validated. And it's because of this, statements like this abound, and we'll not go over this because of time, but as you can see, there are problems, and they're all based on starting assumptions. So don't forget, I like radiometric dating. I think it's a tool that's one of the best ways that we can actually measure time. So that being said, we are going to focus on problem number two, and that is when they form, what is it like? So we need to know the Proton 21 laboratories in Ukraine. That's uh, going to be a focal point for this one. Unfortunately, this place exists in the, one of the worst places in the world as of right now because of a war that's breaking out. But regardless of that, they're working with cold fusion and they're creating super heavy elements using something called Z-Pinch. This is where it gets really amazing because one of the scientists that is now working there before he was began working with the formations of iron. He was able to create the exact ratio and proportions of iron that we have on Earth today from an experiment. Once this formed, we compared that and we were absolutely shocked. He got a job working over at the Proton 21 laboratory, so he brought his experience and education into that. Now, the elements that have been created at that place, again, match what we see on Earth. But even more interesting is that the daughter elements formed an extremely high ratio, higher than we would ever expect. So what happened is this got the scientists into thinking like, um, how are we gonna utilize the high amounts of these daughter elements being produced? Like, what can we do with this? So their goal became that we're going to form high amounts of three particular radioactive elements, tectinium-99, uh, iodine-131, and lutetinium-177, which are used for medical cancer imaging research. So that got me thinking, I'm like, wait a minute, what about the ratios for other radioactive elements that we use to date the age of the earth? So this made me jump right over to aluminum 26, which has a short half-life of just 730,000 years. So what's it doing in such high amounts, but not just in the Milky Way galaxy, but even on earth itself? So the scientists tried to solve this paradox that's going on and they thought maybe the formation was via cosmic rays from the sun but the problem is the sun couldn't have made that requirement in such a high amount in today's world in such a short amount of time so they can throw in any rescue device that they want but the fact is that when we look at the very formation of these things even even the aluminum 26 we're finding that the observational data matches what we see in the laboratory it solves the paradoxes for evolution I think that's a, a great thing as well. But of course, it reduces the age of the Earth to an upper limit of 740,000 years maximum because of that. And then so it made me go over and look at potassium. Lo and behold, potassium ratios are exactly the same that we see on Earth today in the same proportions that we see on Earth today. This, again, would set the upper limit looking at potassium to just 1.25 billion years by looking at that ratio. That brings us to the next piece of evidence, which would be the lead paradox. Now, this is interesting because we have more radiogenic lead than there should be. Unless, of course, you can see right here on the right side that they said unless the Earth formed 13.9 billion years ago or 100 million years after the formation of the universe itself. So obviously this is a huge problem and that can only be resolved through either accelerated nuclear decay or by the observational formation of these elements. Obviously, I'm gonna go with that one myself. So I believe this also explains the distribution of the radioactive elements that we see on Earth today that don't make any evolutionary sense why uranium and thorium are on the crust of the Earth and not deep within the Earth, especially since they're so heavy, they would have sunk to the core or they would have already kind of been in the core creating the power to rotate the Earth itself. But there's also another paradox, right? Over 50% of all radioactive materials exist just in Australia alone as you can see from this map, and 90% of all uranium and thorium is just in Australia. So it's very disproportionate of what would ever be expected. Another analogy would be, I made all of these clocks last week that you can see right here, but they tick at different rates. There's also clocks inside of clocks that also tick at different rates. No one would have ever expected the daughter elements to form as they are today. 
And that's probably why the, this is the first time you're hearing about this. So it comes down to what was expected, which was what the evolutionary community would have expected to find uranium slowly decaying into thorium and iridium and radon. But what we actually found was more indicative of what the experiment showed, that they actually form at exactly the same time in the proportions and ratios that we see today, the exact opposite of the evolutionary prediction. So at first glance, if you were to actually see these clocks in the ground, you would think, well, they're ticking at a constant rate. So obviously, if we take that assumption and we go backwards in time, we can just reverse these clocks and it would tell us the true accurate history. While true on the surface, the most important question that we needed to ask ourselves before agreeing to that idea is what happens if we do go backwards and we run out of history? The clocks are still giving it a time frame, but we actually can't judge it off of that. So I could say that I made these clocks last week and they do tell time perfectly. So I placed these into a computer game from the very start or the dawn of the program and all the NPCs using these clocks. And they came up with the same idea that we did. Like maybe we can reverse these and find out how old something is, but they would need to read the manual to learn that I actually created these just a week ago. And I believe that the Bible is the manual for us that we use to tell us how old something is. And we go with these genealogies back in time and it's not that old. So the same analogy applies today. I think we can tell accurate time that they must be able to tell us accurate history. But if you're using them to tell a time about history that doesn't exist, then we have a problem. And that's exactly what happened based upon the most recent concept of evolution. I think they came in with a preconceived notion to begin with, and then they just kind of ran with that by saying, well, if we find this many daughter isotopes, then this much time must have passed. So one final analogy, I guess I could reiterate my position with, which out of all of these clocks tells better time? Well, they actually all tell really good time. But as I said, I only created them last week. So even though they all have the capacity to tell perfect time, even going backwards, we cannot use them to tell us when they formed. When these elements formed, what were their parent to daughter isotope ratios? That's the golden question. And today, my goal is to answer that. So then we're going to conclude with, we have the formation of both non-radioactive and radioactive elements being formed in the same proportions and ratios that are on the earth today. The radioactive elements form with both parent to daughter isotopes in the radioactive or in the ratios that we find them today. We have the lead paradox, which is solved by either accelerated nuclear decay or the observations made in laboratory experiments, which shows that when lead forms, it exists as it does today, not billions of years ago. It solves the lead paradox. The new discoveries of the rocks in the mantle add further problems for the lead paradox, but it doesn't really matter for us. The new data solves these paradoxes, but the only caveat to that is it shows that the earth is young. So if these elements formed just thousands of years ago in the exact ratio that we see them in today in the laboratory, then why assume they represent billions of years of decay? You can't. If they formed in ratios completely different than today, then sure, you have a great case against me and for eons of time passing. But since we now have observational, physical, repeatable, testable evidence on the contrary, Earth can't be old. And the evidence solves these paradoxes that exist in cosmology as well. So it seems to me that you can either accept the observational data that solves the evolutionary paradoxes or reject it all because it confirms young Earth creation. How dare you! Next, let's ask ourselves, how does this fit into the biblical model and how does this not match the evolutionary concept? Well, we would say that from scripture, we have to look at the very beginning. We read, God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth was formless and without void. Basically, it was just a watery abyss. Then God moved over the face of the great deep and he created the light and the atmosphere and separated the waters from below from the waters above. And then on the following day, he brings forth the dry land and vegetation. From this, it is clear that God made the elements on either day one or day two, since the earth and plants require these radioactive elements. So as these elements were formed, zircon crystals were also forming, trapping within them the early formation of these isotopes and their ratios that we observe forming at the Proton-21 laboratories. And when we look in the early zircon crystals today, which we are testing to determine the age of the Earth, we now know all of the lead that we find had to have come from uranium decay is not true. As stated earlier, these radioactive elements form much higher ratios of daughter elements which would have become trapped inside the zircon crystals that rapidly decayed into lead, leading to the appearance of age. 
and this explains why we perceive them to be old when they are not. This alone is a nail in the coffin for deep time. But what other facts do we have to confirm this model? Well, we have recently discovered that right after the formation of these elements and they became trapped in the zircon, we have found no magnetism change whatsoever for quite some time. This means that there was no plate tectonic movement on the continents. The Bible says that all of the water was gathered into one place and that it was during Noah's flood that the mountains of today formed. This is why it was a young earth creationist who predicted that all of the continents once fit together into one place in the past, using scripture. So this evidence is what we see when we look at the early crystals. It confirms scripture and matches our predictions that we would expect to find if the biblical model was true, but not the evolutionary model. Since evolution not only assumed that plate tectonics was always occurring, but it is also required for life to even arise since their model requires geothermal vents in the ocean is where life originated. So if plate tectonics were not occurring in early Earth, then there is no arrival of life either. So this means both of their early predictions and views of the past are wrong. So the best explanation based on the evidence is that the Bible is the history book of the world and it is reliable as such, and we can make predictions from it. And this model is the only one which can explain why the half-lives are so accurate and can be used for dating things, but they cannot tell us the age of the Earth. But they do point to one thing, that the Earth cannot be old. And this is the only model that can solve all the paradoxes that we see around us today. The chronogenesis model. Everything fits perfectly. Not only all of that, but this model solves the problem for catastrophic plate tectonics, which is a biblical creationist model that looks to accelerated nuclear decay for explaining the high amounts of helium in ancient zircon crystals and the high amounts of argon in volcanic rock. Since this leads to a catastrophic heat problem in their model, which miracles have to be invoked, this new evidence alleviates all those issues. We also see from these crystals that early Earth was not a hellish planet, as evolution has been telling us and expected to find, but rather a water-filled world full of oxygen and Eden from the very beginning, just as the Bible has said. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.